Hello and welcome to Holy Impact Ministries Bible Study Night, a HolyImpactMinistries.com production. I'm Pastor Scott Belain. God bless you and thank you for sharing your time with us here this evening. Today we'll be examining the book of Romans to test the scripture against what we do and do not believe. The book of Romans is one of the most important books of the Brit Hadashah, also known as the New Testament because it is the first book of many that was penned by the Apostle Paul, who wrote over two-thirds of the New Testament. It is imperative that we as Christians have a firm understanding of the writing of the Apostle Paul, because if we get it wrong here in the book of Romans, we'll get it wrong all through the rest of the New Testament writings. Many biblical scholars who are well endowed with more degrees than a thermometer will proudly proclaim that the Apostle Paul taught and preached against the laws of Yahweh God the Father, and that the Apostle Paul never kept the laws, commandments, Sabbaths, or appointments of God, because Jesus nailed them all to the cross, even though the scriptures clearly throw this understanding to the ground time and time again, as we will soon see. The very idea that the Apostle Paul taught that all of God's laws were nailed to the cross is simply unscriptural. It is a denominational doctrine created by denominational charters of men who should have spent more time reading and studying their Bibles than teaching and preaching a broken, man-made theology that simply does not hold water. Proper her hermeneutics and exegesis is critical and can only be executed properly if we understand the context properly. Where was Paul? Who was Paul speaking to exactly? What were the objections Paul was facing? Who were these men that Paul had to do battle with? What was the culture like in the day that he lived in? And what did they believe before Paul got there? These are just some of the things that we need to know and understand before venturing into the writings of the Apostle Paul. Before we jump into the book of Romans, it's important to understand the warning that the Apostle Peter warned us about concerning the writings of the Apostle Paul. Let's take a look and at uh, Peter, uh, 2 Peter 3.15. And we're going to go over there real quick here and check this out. Uh, let me see if I can get over to this. 2 Peter 3.15, here it is. He says this, he says, "...and count the patience of our Lord as salvation." Just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. Now listen to this. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. And here comes the warning. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, what Peter is saying, is, he says, now that I'm telling you this, now that you know this, he says, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people to, and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, to him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So here we can see a direct warning from the Apostle uh, Peter, and he says very clearly, he says that the writings of Paul are hard to understand. The ignorant and the unstable will twist them to their own direct, uh, destruction as they do the other scriptures. And how many times have we seen men standing behind pulpits today who have a store-bought theology that they gained from some Bible college, Bible school, or just out on the street trying to tell us uh, these things about Paul that are just simply not true, that Paul preached against circumcision. We're going to prove here today in the book of Romans that Paul never preached against circumcision. And we're also going to prove that Paul always kept the laws of God. Uh, but we need what we need to do is we need to heed Peter's warning. Peter warned us. He said, knowing this beforehand, and I want us to really pay attention to this warning, Take care that you are not carried away with the error of what kind of people? Lawless people. And lose your own stability. If we are paying attention to lawless people, my friends, uh, we will lose our own stability. And we need to remember, what does it uh, tell us in John, uh, I believe it's 2.4. John 2.4 tells us, he says, it says, 
for those who say that they know him, if they are not keeping his commandments, then they are liars and the truth is not in them. Very, very easy for us to know and to understand. So this all ties nice and neatly together when we start looking at this warning from Peter. Now, there are a couple of terms that we need to know and that we need to understand before we move into the writings of the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans. And the first one that we need to look at is the uh, Torah, the word Torah. Torah means instruction. The first five books of the Bible, also known as the Pentateuch, uh, are very important for us to understand. It simply means instruction. The other term that we need to know and understand, or the idea that we need to know and understand, is the oral law. And you'll hear a lot about this from biblical scholars uh, who are worth a pound of salt. They will clearly know and understand the oral laws of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Talmudic oral law of the scribes and the Pharisees were written by men. They were not written by Yahweh God the Father. This is why Yeshua Jesus pointed to the Pharisees and referred to them as blind guides, a brood of vipers, hypocrites, and even twofold children of hell. You see, the Talmudic law, also known as the oral law, was written by men. They were laws that men had written over top of God's laws. And it was these very man-made, man-created laws that created a new law that put man before God and gave the authority uh, of God to men instead of God. Much the same way that Catholicism in today's modern-day version of Christianity has done. As King Solomon so eloquently put it in Ecclesiastes 1.9, there is nothing new under the sun. Something that we uh, would do well to keep in mind is the warning that comes directly from our Messiah in Matthew 5.20, where he warns us that if our righteousness does not exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, that we will never enter the kingdom of heaven. It's important at this point to make a critical distinction between the biblical Judaism and the Pharisaical Judaism of the first century. During the creation of the first church that we will soon see in the book of Romans, obedience to the law was a way of life after God's people have been redeemed. It was a response to the grace of God. The early church did not obey the laws of God to be saved. They were obedient to the laws of God because they were saved. They were obedient because of the promise of the hope of the salvation that had been freely given to them through the death, burial, and resurrection of our Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, who came not to abolish the law, but to abolish the penalty from breaking the law, which was death. Romans 8.2. Let's go ahead and take a look at Romans 8.2. See if I can find that for you here. I think we had that... Uh, Bookmark. Yeah, we sure did. Let's take a look at that very quickly. Here it is. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, from what? From the law? No, not the law. From the law of sin and death. We need to know and we need to understand very clearly that when you broke the law, that was sin. What is the biblical definition of sin? The biblical definition of sin is the transgression of the law. So, if sin is the transgression of the law, then there is a penalty for that. When you sin, when you transgress against the law, the penalty for sin was death. This is what Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, came to lay his life down for is to erase the, the, the penalty for sin, which is death. He did not come to remove God's laws. And we need to know and we need to understand these things uh, as we move forward and as we progress. And we'll prove these things out to you as we move along. Now, one of the things that I want to do at this point in time is I just want us to relax, have a cup of coffee, get a cup of hot chocolate, whatever you like, uh, and just relax a little bit. We're going to do some things here that are unscripted. And we are just going to go through and comb through the first chapter of Romans. And I think you're going to find it very interesting. The first thing that I'd like to do is I'd like to explain a little bit about the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul was an extremely intelligent man. He came from Tarsus, which was the academic 
uh, capital of the world at that point in time. Uh, they had many colleges and schools there, uh, Plato, Socrates, uh, all of these, Aristotle, all of these teachings were coming to fruition. Uh, there was a maj paj of different Greek gods. Every time the Roman Empire were to take over a country uh, or even a city, whatever god that they served was just kind of brought into the Roman Empire. And the Romans had literally thousands of gods, uh, if you were a Roman, that you could select to, to bow down to and to worship. It was, there was everything from astrology and the Hellenistic uh, era and all of these different things and Jupiter and Apollo and Zeus and Diana and all of these things. And you'll read some of that stuff as we go through the book of Romans. But we need to understand the culture that Paul was in. I mean, this was, the world was a, a, an absolute mess. People were worshiping everything. Everything from trees and plants to the stars, sun, sun, moon, and the stars. So we're going to see this as we, as we see Paul walk out his journey in the book of Romans. But it's very important for us to know, understand, Paul was extremely educated. He sat at the feet of Gamliel. Now, Rabbi Gamliel was the uh, world-renowned rabbi at that point in time. In order to even sit at the feet of Gamliel you had to have committed the Torah to memory. So this was quite a feat. And Paul himself was a Pharisee. So we know that Paul could speak at least three different languages. We know that through reading the, uh, the New Testament, and we'll get to some of that. Uh, he, had, uh, he was well-versed in Aristotle and Socrates and, and Platonism and all of these kinds of things. He knew these things. And we can see some evidence of this in his writings. He even uses these different gods and some of their theories and their theologies against the people to help them to realize who the one true God really is. So Paul, with all of this knowledge and all of these degrees that he had, speaking three languages, being well educated in the Torah, having it committed to memory, sitting at the feet of Gamaliel, well versed in, in all of these uh, uh, Platonism and Socrates and Aristotle and all these other kinds of things. I want us to, to understand something. With all of those degrees that he had, he could not distinguish Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, as the Messiah. With all of the degrees, a man with more degrees than a thermometer could not see who Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, was until, until the Messiah knocked him off his horse on the way to Damascus and struck him blind. Only then could this man, with all of this worldly knowledge, understand who the Messiah was. He lived in the time of Yeshua HaMashiach. He, he very well could have rubbed his shoulders with him and not even known who he was. So this, let this be a lesson to us. You know, we have a lot of men out there who have all kinds of degrees, who have been to college for years, years and years of philosophy, years and years of hermeneutics and exegesis and theology and all of these different things in church history and still have a hard time distinguishing what in the world the Scripture says. Now, why is that? Very clearly, our Messiah tells us in Matthew 23, uh, 8 through 12, he says, Call no man on earth your father, for you have one father who is in heaven. And call no man your instructor, for you have one instructor, the Christ. Who is it that we are to learn from? Is it a college? Is it a school? Did Yeshua ever say, uh, go to college and get a degree and then you can preach? Or did he say, I am your teacher? I am your teacher. My friends, there is a huge difference between men who are anointed by men and men who are anointed by Yahweh God the Father. Now, with that being said, I don't want to say anything... Uh, too derogatory about someone who has a good education, because this is important to have a good education. But it is more important to pray to Yahweh God the Father, to have that personal relationship with Him, and to ask Him to teach us so that we would have the discernment to be able to see through the teachings of men and see what Yahweh God wants us to see. There are many men who have more degrees than a thermometer who are good godly men. Because they, they learned what they learned from men, but they know how to differentiate the truth of God from the doctrines and the theologies of men. Some men 
not so much. Some men trust in what they've learned. They trust in their store-bought theology. They trust in what they bought and paid for, and they will not let go of it. And this is why we have so many people that are, are just absolutely blinded and confused. And these are the people that uh, we are told about in the book of uh, Jude. If you read the book of Jude, you'll know and understand that these men were already foretold that they were going to come into the church and they were, going to turn, they were going to turn the gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach into lasciviousness. And this is what we have seen in our churches today. So I want us to know and I want us to understand these things as we move forward. Uh, so that's a, just a little bit of a history about the Apostle Paul. His name was Rabbi Sheol, and that's what they called him, Rabbi Sheol. Uh, there is a misconception out there that Paul's name, Paul's had his name changed to Paul. It was never changed. That is just the Greek word uh, for Paul. That's just what his name is. So uh, we don't have to believe in different things like that. And Paul had his name changed and all that kind of stuff. He did not. He was always known as Rabbi Sheol, and it just translates into Paul in the Greek. Now, Knowing these things, and I just want to say this again, knowing these things and being aware of the warning of uh, Peter, who tells us that the writings of Paul are difficult to understand, we should know, that should send flags up, that we cannot just open our Bibles and read the Apostle Paul and take it at face value. You just simply cannot do that. And I believe that there is a reason for that. Uh, our Messiah, you know, the apostles once asked our Messiah, they said, why does the Messiah, why do you speak to them in parables? Why don't you just speak to them openly? And he said very clearly, he says, I do not want the wicked to understand. Those who have chosen to bow the knee to the wicked one, to ignore the things of God, who would have made themselves the seed of the serpent, he says, I don't want them to understand. And this is exactly why he told them these things. So this is exactly why I believe that the writings of Paul are hard to understand. Only those who truly want to know, who truly seek him, who truly are looking for his word, are going to understand these scriptures the way he wants us to understand them. The rest of the world, once again, will twist those writings and twist the scriptures to their own destruction. So, with that in mind, uh, I think we're ready to jump into the book of Romans. And I have some notes here and some things here. I just want to make sure that we kind of go uh, kind of systematically here. Uh, let's go ahead and see if we can't jump into Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Here we go. And I'm excited. Grab a cup of coffee, relax a little bit, and uh, let's get into what the book of Romans says and does not say according to the Apostle Paul. Okay. Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, a servant of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now, let's stop right there for just a minute, because right here is something that a lot of people miss. Listen to this, which is in the red. Which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scripture. So what he's saying here is Yeshua was prophesied by the prophets that he would come. And if we look at the Torah, there are literally thousands of things that point to Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, as being the Messiah. In fact, much of our, our Jewish brethren are now coming to the realization of who the Messiah really is. They were fooled for many, many, many years because of Catholicism. Catholicism was the joining of paganry with Christianity. And uh, anybody who knows Catholicism at all and, and understands their church history can know and understand that Catholicism stole Christianity back uh, in about the 3rd century. And you, you could actually be murdered for even owning a Bible or reading the Scriptures. If you do not know that, please uh, do your homework, know and understand what that was all about. The, when Constantine became the emperor and he won the battle at Milvin Bridge and supposedly saw a cross in the sky and turned himself into a Christian, uh, at that point in time, he took all of these other gods that the Romans had. Remember, every time they would conquer a land, they would just accumulate their gods and let the people worship however they wanted to. So there was an infighting within the Roman Empire. All of these things were going on. Constantine decided to settle all that by saying, look, everybody's going to be a Christian. 
So he made Christianity uh, a, an, an empire, basically, and it was a state-ruled religion is what it was. Now, a lot of the people had problems, and they were still kind of fighting, so what happened was he just took a... because Constantine was a pagan himself from birth, always was. In fact, there's no evidence that uh, the, uh, the Holy Spirit was ever in Constantine at all throughout his whole life. We and many people believe, and many scholars and, and many theologians and historians believe that Constantine never was a Christian. In fact, this is why he drug all of this paganry into the Roman Catholic Church. And this is why we have things like the first day of the week, Sabbath, Christmas, Easter, Lent, Advent, Valentine's Day, Halloween even, is Catholic-created doctrine. And uh, we need to know and we need to understand these things. So getting back to the scriptures, I just want us to see that this was prophesied that, the, that Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, would come, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. I don't want to get too far away from the book of Romans, because if we do, we'll never be able to understand what we are studying. But this, is, this all comes to fruition and it all ties in. We need to know how we got away from this. How did we get away from the truth of what the Bible says? Again, if you have any questions about these things, you can visit us at holyimpactministries.com and go to our five-part God's Laws Still Stand study course. Uh, it really doesn't take that much time to go through, but you'll find them, I believe, extremely interesting, and they will help you in this Bible uh, study course if you're going to take this course. Um, so, so please visit us at holyimpactministries.com, go to our HIM video studies, and right at the top of the page, you'll see the first five videos there are a, a video series called God's Laws Still Stand. It explains how the church got lost in the first place. It explains the true identity of a Christian. It understands the writings of Paul and why they were misunderstood and how they were misunderstood. And there is a scriptural debate on the last two of those that will help you understand the writings of Paul a little bit better. And some of the uh, scriptures from Romans are actually in those video teaching series. So those may help you a little bit throughout the week. If you'd like to go view those, if you have not seen them, we encourage you to go see them. Okay, so let's continue on. So here we have uh, Paul telling us that Yeshua was prophesied about before he came. It says, concerning his son, he says, which he prophesied beforehand through his prophets and in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. Now I want to stop here again. Extremely important what we're seeing here through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about what? To bring about faith. Does it say faith? It says the obedience of faith. To bring about the obedience of faith. Faith, many people believe that faith is all about just saying, I believe, I believe, I believe, and you're good to go, and you're once saved, always saved. Come up here, say a 60-second prayer, and walk out and do as you please. Because once saved, always saved, all you have to do is believe. All of God's laws are nailed to the cross. We live in a dispensational state of grace. My friends, those are all lies. Every one of them is a man-made doctrine. It is a lie. There is no such thing as once saved, always saved. And faith has fruit. Faith has evidence. Why do you think our Messiah told us that we would know them by their fruits? Because if you have faith, you will obey the things of God. I want to show you something here. Uh, 1 John 2, 4. Let's go over there and take a look at that very quickly here. Here, we'll, we'll start at 1 John 2, 3. It says, By this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Do we see that? If we keep his commandments. So how do we know that we know him? If we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is what? He's a liar, and the truth is not in him. So if he's not keeping the seventh-day Sabbath, 
if he's not keeping the appointments and the feast days of Yahweh God the Father, if he's not walking in the ways of Yahweh God the Father and being obedient to the things of God, then he is a liar and the truth is not in him. But, but, whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Now, we should know that as Christians. We are to walk as Yeshua HaMashiach walked. What did he say? He said, I did not come to, to abolish the law. I came to fulfill them. He says, heaven and earth will not pass away. Uh, and not one, not one crossing of a T or the dotting of an I will pass from the law until heaven and earth both pass away and all is accomplished. My friends, we're still standing on the earth. The prophecies are not all accomplished. And God's laws still stand. And we know that from our Messiah. So if he fulfilled the laws, we too are commanded to walk as he walked and fulfill the law. Now, many people will argue with you and they'll say, well, you can't fulfill the law. You, you can't because if you break one, you break them all and yada, 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 yada. And they will just go off like, uh, like they're on, uh, they need some Ritalin or something, which I don't uh, recommend, by the way. Uh, but this is how it happens. I mean, they just they just absolutely get all upset when you tell them these things and you show them these things because that doesn't match up to the Roman Catholic theology that even the Protestant churches follow after. You see, they believe that God's laws are all nailed to the cross and you don't have to do anything. They believe in the Devil's Bible. The Devil's Bible says, Do as thou wilt. And that's what they believe. They believe that they can do whatever they want to do. Now, they will say, oh, no, 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 we don't believe that. We don't believe that. But that is what they believe. They believe once saved, always saved. If you believe in once saved, always saved, and you don't have to be obedient, then you are believing in the do-as-thou-wilt religion of Satan himself. And this is what has been preached for so long. And this is why even homosexuals now still believe that they can be Christian because once saved, always saved. You taught that to me. So now our pastors and preachers who have been teaching this have to lay in that bed that they have made for themselves. And now people are throwing that same doctrine right back up in their faces. Well, hey, I'm once saved, always saved. Why can't I be a homosexual? I'm saved, right? I admit it with my mouth. I confess with my mouth. Jesus is the one I believe. And that's all there is to it, right? Because once again, we have people that should have spent more time studying their Bible and asking Yahweh God for discernment rather than being anointed by men and the, the wonderful studies of all of this man-made theology and doctrine and garbage that's out there. Uh, and again, most of it stems from Catholicism because that is what is taught. Uh, Catholicism, once again, believes that if the church forgives you, uh, then you are forgiven. And they sell indulgences and that is a worthless piece of paper that says the church forgives you of all of your sins and you can get out of purgatory and you can even get your family out of purgatory if you put enough money in the, in the pot, in the coffer. This is all historical. Look up the word indulgence. You'll know and understand what we're talking about. But this is what I want to get back to here uh, with this particular scripture, the obedience of faith. Now, what did we see the obedience of faith is? It is obeying the commandments and keeping the commandments of God. Because if you don't, then you're a liar and the truth is not in you. So do we see that? I want us to see that and I want us to know and understand this is what the Word of God says. There is an obedience to faith. The obedience of faith for the sake of His name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. He says, First I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. So here, I just want to stop uh, very quickly. We can see and understand that Paul's been yearning to come to Rome. He's been wanting to come here. He is supposed to be in charge of bringing the Gentiles in. And this is important to him. He is a Pharisee. He knows the laws of God very, 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 very well. And Yeshua HaMashiach has sent him out 
to the Gentiles, to grab up the Gentiles and to, and to spread the good word. So he's not afraid, and he's boldly coming to them. He says, For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Now, if faith is just saying, I believe, and there's no works in faith, how are you going to be encouraged by someone else's faith? How can, you, how can we possibly be encouraged in a thought? Okay, I, I believe, and, I, and I'm just going to say that. I'm going to keep it in my head. I'm going to keep it in my heart. But I'm going to do whatever I want. Is that going to encourage anyone to believe in, in the Messiah? No, it's not. The only thing that's going to encourage any, any, anyone is to see how you walk. Do you walk in the ways of Yahweh God the Father? Do you cuss and throw in a fit when you get angry? Do you, do you curse people? Do you not forgive? Do you do all of these things? Do you drink and, and, and commit adultery and all of these things? Because if you do, then you're not going to be very encouraging to someone else. We encourage each other by our each other's faith. Okay, let's continue. Both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far I have been prevented. So again, Paul's been prevented from coming. He's been hastening to come to them, but he hasn't been able to. He's been very busy. In order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks, which is the Greek would be a Gentile, both to the Greeks or the, or the Gentiles, and to barbarians, both to wise and to the foolish. Okay, so let's read that again. I am under obligation, Paul says, both to Greeks and barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, you're going to see this over and over again. To the Jew first and then to the Greek. Why are you going to see that? Why to the Jew first? Well, if we look and we read the whole Bible, and especially from the beginning, we would know and understand that God has chosen no other people on the face of the earth to be his people other than the Israelites. No other people. None. The only people God says are his are the Israelites. Okay? And this is very important for us to know and to understand. Not the Americans, not the Germans, not the French, not the British, not the Chinese, not the Japanese. No other people, period. None. Who is the father of all nations? Abraham is the father of all nations. So we need to know and we need to understand this. First to the Jew and then also to the Greek. Yeshua HaMashiach came to uh, uh, the lost sheep of Israel. That's who he was sent for. Why? Well, because there was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. For those of you who do not know, and this is another whole Bible study in itself, but just to shorten this up and give you a short synopsis, there was the northern kingdom, known as the kingdom of Israel, and the southern kingdom, known as the kingdom of Judah, uh, or the northern kingdom, sometimes known as the kingdom of Ephraim. But they broke. Israel broke. And the Benjamites and the, Judea, the, the Judeites were down here, and the rest of the tribes were uh, kind of in the northern kingdom. Well, the northern kingdom continued to whore against God with all of these other gods. So God divorced them. Okay, he divorced them. Now, he gave them a decree of divorce, and he scattered them through the four corners of the earth. Now, Judah also was taken into bondage, but Judah returned. Okay, and remember... Uh, Yahweh God the Father promised David that his lineage would sit on the throne. So we know that Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, is connected to the lineage of David. And that promise also is fulfilled. So here comes the house of Judah. They come back because of the Maccabees. And this is much about what we celebrate during Hanukkah. When Antiochus Epiphanes took the temple and tore it down and, and uh, put a, a, a statue of Zeus in there and slaughtered pigs on the altar and did all of these things in the temple of God, he was a picture of the Antichrist. Uh, but then the Maccabees fought against uh, Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, and this was a major, this is another whole study, but this was, a, this was an army, Antiochus Epiphanes, 
that was the leftover remnants of the army of uh, Alexander the Great, which had taken over the whole known world, uh, basically, as we know it. So this was a monolithic-sized army that Antiochus Epiphanes had when he went against uh, Judah Maccabees, and this is in the book of Maccabees. Once again, the book of Maccabees was included in the King James Version of the Bible for 274 years until they took it out. I think it was 1858 when they took the books out of the King James Version. For those of you King James Version enthusiasts, uh, you need to know that the apocryphal books were included in the King James Version for 274 years. Okay, but uh, I just wanted to kind of, I don't want to get off track here. We can just go down so many rabbit holes. But again, Judah came back, and through the Maccabees, the temple was once again restored, and that's why there was a temple there when Yeshua, Jesus, came and he was born. There was a temple for him to walk in because of the fight that the Maccabees had with Antiochus Epiphanes, and they took back the temple. And again, Hanukkah is the eight-day restoration. They had to clean that temple, get that blood out of there, and do certain uh, sacrifices in there to make the oblation be able to be started again uh, to the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our Father who is in heaven. So, this is uh, a little bit of the history, and this is why Yeshua comes back, because the northern kingdom was completely divorced and dispersed, and they were in the process of being dispersed. Some of them were still in Israel. So, who did Yeshua come for? He came for the lost sheep of Israel. That's who he came for, and I want us to know and understand that. Let's go to, um, I think I have this bookmarked, uh, let's see, in E9, let's see here. Yes, I do, right here. Let's listen to this scripture. This is Matthew, we're going to start at 10.5. He says, these 12 Jesus sent out instructing them. Now, this is when Jesus sent the 12 out to preach and to teach the gospel, okay? He says, go nowhere among the Gentiles, okay? Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans. Do we see that? So who is he sending the twelve out to? Well, let's read a little farther. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he's telling them, don't go to the Gentiles. Go to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, why is that? Well, I thought we were all saved. You know, this is kind of confusing. People don't understand this. But let's continue. He says, And proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he wants them to skip the Gentiles and go directly to the lost sheep of Israel. Why? Let me explain why he did this and why he was sent for the lost sheep of Israel. According to Jewish law, when a man divorces his wife for adultery, she cannot return. She cannot return. They're done. Forever. That's it. So uh, the Jewish people and the Israelites were all wondering, now what's going to happen? You know, God made it final. He divorced us. Okay? And so they were thinking, how in the world are we ever going to be reconciled back to Yahweh God the Father? And no one really knew or understand how that was going to happen. And at that point in time, I'm sure uh, Hasatan, uh, our advers adversary, the devil, probably was given a big old belly laugh. He thought he'd won. That was it. Until the Messiah comes. Then when he comes, he lays down his life and through baptism, through baptism, through his death, burial, and, and resurrection, that's why he commanded us. He said, you must be born by both the water and the spirit or you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Because the Israelite people, okay, from the northern kingdom, had to be put to death. They had to be put to death in the flesh. The only way to do that was through Yeshua's work at the cross. Now they could be baptized. When they are baptized, they are immersed under the water to signify baptism, to signify going down to the grave. Then they are raised up in the newness of life and given the Holy Spirit. Now they are a new bride that can be restored to her groom. This is the only way that Israel can could have been restored back to God the Father. So in order for the Gentiles to be grafted back into the olive tree, he first had to save the olive tree. And we can get into the two sticks in Ezekiel and the, and the sticks where he binds the two sticks together. That's another whole Bible teaching uh, for another story. But this, again, was prophesied many, 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 many years ago. 
So, Yeshua comes back, and the main thing he wants to do is he wants to gather the lost sheep of Israel to let them know you can now come back to Yahweh God the Father. He wants you back. He loves you. He wants you. Uh, and you can come back through this work that I am doing at the cross. Okay? So, any Israelite, any Jewish person who is baptized in the water and the Spirit now becomes a true Jew again. You see, these Jews that are outside the will of God are not really true Jews. And even Yeshua tells us this. You are not a Jew outwardly, not someone who is a Jew outwardly, but someone who is a Jew inwardly. Everything he does is about the heart. It's not about outward appearances and it's not about outward things. It's about the heart. Does the heart drive you to do the things of God? Because if it does, then you have the Holy Spirit. And this is how you can know you have evidence of the Holy Spirit. I am often asked, how do I know if I have the Holy Spirit? Do you yearn to follow the things of God? Do you look forward to his holy seventh-day Sabbath that is a sign between him and his people that is a perpetual agreement for all generations? Or do you just shun that and it doesn't mean anything to you? This is the evidence of uh, whether or not you have the Holy Spirit of God. And this is very important for us to know and understand. Let me see. I think I have that uh, bookmarked here. Let's just go take a look at that one more time. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. There it is. Whoever says, I know him, does not keep his commandments. is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Once again, we have that scripture right there. Let's go to um, this as well. What is the, the, the biblical definition of the love of God? By this, we may know that we, are, we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. Now listen to this. This is the biblical definition of the love of God. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. This, my friends, is how you know that you indeed have him in you and you in him. This is how you know that you have the Holy Spirit of God. Okay, so very good. I wanted to uh, just kind of make that clear to us. And let's go back here very quickly. And let's see here. Encouraged by each other's faith. Where were we? We were down here to the barbarians. Uh, first, to the Gru first to the Jew and then to the Greek. So this is why he says, and this is why it is written, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Okay, first to the Jew, because the Jews are part of the 12 tribes of Israel, okay, and they are all one nation. Now, the two sticks have been joined together to make one olive tree. There is one people, one people. And what does Paul tell us in the book of Galatians? He tells us very clearly, there is no Jew, there is no Greek, there's not even a man and a woman. You are all one in Christ. And you are the heirs, if you are one in Christ, you are the heirs of Abraham. So if you're an heir of Abraham, you're the offspring of Abraham, then you are an Israelite. But you will have pastors fight you tooth and nail up and down, back and forth, and they will tell you anything and everything but the truth. My friends, if you have any question about who you are as a Christian, please go to holyimpactministries.com. And I want you to go to our five-part study that, that uh, is about God's laws still stand. The second one, part two, is about the true identity of a Christian. And I want us to know and I want us to understand these things. This is just so very, very important for us to understand. What is the true identity of a Christian? Go look at that video teaching and uh, we get into Romans 11 and Galatians and what Paul said and what Paul did not say. Uh, and it'll lock it down for you. And no one will be able to lie to you again. So we need to know and understand what the first thing that Yeshua had to do is he had to graft the Israelites back to God. Then the tree, the two sticks were once again made one. And the root of that tree is the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach himself. He is holy. He is the first fruit. And we who come together then are part of that olive tree. Read Romans 11 and you'll better understand. Okay, so that's why the Jew first, and then the Gentile. And it tells us very clearly, well, we can get into the book of Romans, but I'll leave that for now because that's another, another teaching. But read the 11th chapter uh, of Romans, and we'll get to that. For in, uh, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by 
faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now, let's look at that word righteousness that he's talking about there. I want us to understand the biblical definition of uh, righteousness, and I have that bookmarked uh, here as well. Let's go to um, E7 here. I think I have it bookmarked here. Yes, it is. Okay. Deuteronomy 6.5 says this about righteousness. And we, want to, we always want to let the Bible define the Bible. What does the Bible say righteousness is? It says here, De- Deuteronomy 6.25, And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all the, this commandment before the Lord our God as he commanded us to do. Okay, let's go take a look at another scripture in the New Testament. This is Old Testament scripture. Let's look at New Testament scripture. And in Luke 1, 6 says, And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statues of the Lord. Has anything changed between Deuteronomy and Luke, between the Old Testament and the New Testament? Has it? Really? Really? I mean, let's go back and let's take a look. Once again, let's go to, uh, I had it bookmarked here. Here's Deuteronomy. This is the Old Testament. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all this commandment before the Lord our God as he commanded us. Okay? Very quickly, let's go over to Luke. What does it say? Exactly the same thing. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and the statutes of the Lord Yahweh God the Father. So, We need to see what righteousness means. What is righteousness? It is following the commandments and the statutes of the Lord. Both the Old and the New Testament tell us this. Okay? Not hard for us to understand. Okay. Very good. So I want us to uh, understand that word righteousness. When you hear that, you know what the biblical definition of righteousness actually is. Okay. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, uh, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Let's stop there for just a second. What is he saying here? Let's read that again. For his his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in things that have been made. My friends, you know, oftentimes, I will, uh, I will just go sit in my backyard to clear my head and to think. And you cannot sit outside in a park or outside anywhere without noticing bees pollinating flowers, returning to their nests, birds flying overhead, knowing and understand that these things all had a designer. Okay, how did... Just think about it for a moment. How does a bee fly miles, now a bee is as small as your little fingernail, fly for miles to pollinate uh, plants and crops and to gather uh, pollen and then bring it back to his nest and find a little hole in the ground uh, miles and miles away from where he's at. I mean, think about it. A bee the size of a fingernail doesn't have the brain of a human, but he knows how to navigate. Same thing with birds. They navigate down south thousands of miles, thousands of miles, to a tree down south for the wintertime. And then they migrate back up here in the springtime to the exact same tree, the exact same nest that they were at. How does that happen? We need to know and understand that even Einstein told us, he said, without the bumblebee, humanity would be extinct. Why? Because the bumblebee is responsible for pollinating all the crops. There would be no food without the bumblebee. In fact, right now, uh, the world scientists are very worried about the bumblebee because it is becoming extinct. They are vanishing from the earth. Google this information. Again, another sign of the times that we live in. We are indeed living in the end of days. Uh, And this is another thing that will cause famine to happen. It is already happening, and it is happening at 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 an astonishing rate all around us. Uh, Many of us who live in America are not privy to these things because we don't pay attention. But if we pay attention to the news and we know what's going on around us, uh, what did our Messiah tell us in the book of Luke, chapter 12? He says, you hypocrites! 
He says, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and sky. Why do you not know how to interpret the times that you live in? And why do you not judge for yourselves what is right? Uh, so we are expected to know these things. Okay, very good. Let's get back to uh, where we are here. Okay, so they are without excuse. So there's no way that you can, by this scripture right here, what he's saying is, there's no way that you can just sit outside and not know that God exists. He is all around you, everywhere, at all times. Just in just his very creation pronounces his name. Even the rocks cry out to him and worship him. So they are without excuse. Let's read that again. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and foolish hearts, their foolish hearts, were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Once again, men with more degrees than a thermometer, claiming to be wise, just like the Pharisees, became fools. And they exchanged the glory of God, uh, the immortal God, for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Now, I want us to hear this now, my friends, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Now, let's take a look at this and let's just stop here for a moment. And let's just think about these judges who are dressed in black robes who no one elected, who have changed and redefined the biblical definition of marriage. Claiming to be wise, they have became they have become fools. It very it, these are who he's talking about, my friends. Therefore God gave them up to the lust of their hearts to the impurity of dishonoring their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator forever. Uh, amen. For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up their natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for other men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what not ought to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetous, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those practice such things deserve to die, they, do not, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. My friends, these are the kinds of people that Yahweh God the Father has turned over to a debased mind. He says very clearly, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what not ought to be done. And sometimes, my friends, I know and understand how hard it is when we preach the truth of God's Word. And even now, they are creating laws that are telling us that we cannot preach the Word of God, and we need to change the Bible. In fact, there are, are, are people actually trying to write laws to change the Bible, to change the words in the Bible, to black out things that we are allowed to say and things that we are not allowed to say. You know, when it first became evident that there was a rising problem with homosexuality in the United States. People often said, well, who cares if two gay people get married? It's not my business. It doesn't affect me any. And what happened? Now we're realizing that it affects everyone. Now not only do gay people want to get married, 
But they also want to sue bakers and take away their family business that they've had for generations. Uh, bakers and photographers and even pastors now going to jail for not marrying uh, homosexuals. And other people now calling Christians haters, putting Christians on the terrorist watch list, now even making laws that say, if you call a little boy who is a little boy, but doesn't want to be a little boy, he wants to be a little girl, if you call him a little boy, you can go to jail for that in some states. They are actually passing laws that you cannot call someone something that they don't want to be called, even if they genetically are a boy. Uh, it is, it is uh, once again, my friends, it, claiming to be wise, claiming to be wise, they became fools. Can we not see this? Can we not know what is happening all around us? So, uh, we've gone on for a while here. This is the first chapter. We are at the end of the first chapter of Romans. We're going to stop right there. We're going to ask you guys to to uh, keep this video with you. You know, reverse it, go forward, go backward, stop, check these things out, test them for yourselves, uh, look at the scriptures, and know and understand what they say and what they do not say. We always want you at Holy Impact Ministries to test everything. Uh, and that's what we want you to do. Be a Berean. Be those who are elevated above those who just sit in a church pew for 45 minutes on Sunday and think that they know the Word of God. They do not. They put a few dollars in the offering, golden offering plate and they go on about the rest of the week sinning and doing whatever they want to do. And there's many country songs about being in the bar on Saturday night and church in Sunday morning. Again, going to church on the wrong day of the week following Catholicism. That's not even commanded by Yahweh God the Father, thinking that they're once saved, always saved, so that it's okay to go to the bar on Saturday night in church in the morning and put your money in there and think that you're going to be saved. This is not scriptural. It is man-made, and you will lose your salvation if you live that way. Uh, we need to know and understand these things. And this is just a, the tip of the iceberg. This is the first chapter of the book of Romans and some things that we can glean from this first chapter of Romans. So uh, I hope and I pray that this has blessed you, my friends. Uh, this is just so important for us to know and so important for us to, to understand. And before I let you go, uh, I just want to say this. If, indeed, you have any questions at all about this teaching, feel free to email, email me. You can email me at pastorv at holyimpactministries.com. And uh, I will get back and I will answer your emails uh, just as soon as I can. Uh, it may take some time. A lot of times, uh, sometimes people get mad because I don't get them back right away the same day or even two days. Sometimes it takes three or four days, sometimes, depending on what we are all wrapped up in. So uh, I, wanted, I just want you to know and I want you to understand that I will definitely answer that email. Give me a little bit of time and we'll get to it right away. We don't have uh, a staff of people right now that are answering all these emails. And uh, that takes time to get people who are, have enough wisdom to do these things. And uh, right now we just don't have that. We are building the ministry as we go. Uh, we want to thank you once again for sharing your time with us here at HolyImpactMinistries.com. My hope and my prayer is that the grace and the peace of God would be upon you, and also that God's hand would, of protection would be upon you and your family until we meet again. Hopefully, we will see you on the Seventh-day Sabbath. That is another program that we have, just kind of keeps people up with the ministry and what is going on in the ministry, what is going on uh, in the world. We spend that time as kind of a holy convocation where brothers and sisters just kind of join together. It's unscripted, much like what this is, and uh, we just talk about things. So uh, be sure to uh, uh, visit us on the Seventh-day Sabbath. We try to have those videos up by 9 o'clock Saturday morning, uh, for those of you who don't know. But in the meantime, God bless you. Thank you for visiting with us on our Wednesday night, 8 o'clock Bible studies at holyimpactministries.com as we plunge into the writings of Paul in the book of Romans. God bless you and shalom.